Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming this morning. Uh, my name is Richard Soden. I'm an application engineer within the Aerospace Defense uh, Solutions team. I work for Phil, and I'm lucky enough to share an office with Augustin in Switzerland. Um, we choose the best places for, uh, for our offices. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, electronic warfare. I'm going to Firstly, I, I have two presentations this morning. This first one is really um, a backgrounder, just to make sure that we're all speaking around the same subjects. There is a lot of terms within radar and EW, uh, electronic warfare, and EW is one of those terms, um, that we need to be speaking about and, and understanding uh, when we talk about these applications. So, electronic warfare is a military action involving the use of the electromagnetic spectrum um, and that can be directed energy or it can be uh, use of uh, systems such as radar and countermeasures around that and typically um, as, it, as it's a warfare activity it's used to attack an enemy okay so typically we're talking about uh, a battlefield and you'll hear a lot of uh, talk about electromagnetic spectrum dominance and our ability to uh, control uh, our electromagnetic spectrum and that's being used as a, as a battleground as, as Phil mentioned. So this presentation is going to be talking about um, electronic warfare and we can't talk about electronic warfare without giving a background about radar systems. Um, we'll be talking around the threat environment and then we'll be getting uh, into the details of electronic warfare and I'll be specifically talking about three, uh, three particular um, activities being electronic support, electronic attack and electronic protect. Um, these are basically um, uh, countermeasures and counter countermeasures. And then I'll talk about a specific system that's available from Keysight today that will allow you to do some testing and evaluation around such systems. So, radar. Um, I mentioned yesterday, and, and I feel I don't know if you knew this before yesterday, but um, back in World War II, the, uh, the UK was involved in some information warfare and fake news. And that was that they, were, they disseminated the story that eating carrots was good for your eyes, and that the uh, British pilots were eating carrots and seeing aeroplanes as they were flying uh, uh, in, during the Second World War. And in fact, that was false. They were using radar systems. And during the Second World War was the first use of uh, radar systems. And um, at that time, they were... Sorry? Can you speak up? Not loud enough. I think my, it's my audio. Can, can we turn this up, please? I told you. Otherwise, I, I, otherwise, I'll be shouting. <laughs> so... Um, in, uh, during the Second World War, the, those first radar systems were very simple uh, radar detection and ranging. So basically using an RF pulse, emitting that, and then collecting the reflected energy. It was one data point that would allow you to see if there was something in your airspace. As radar systems have developed, we're looking to increase the amount of data that's available to us on that return pulse. But those radar systems are still looking to uh, have certain limitations and trade-offs. And so we have this, this equation here. Uh, we can't see all of it here, so you can maybe see it over on the second projector over here, is the radar range equation. I, I won't be going through the math. Phil has enough math later on on phase noise. Um, but basically, this talks about the trade-offs that are available in terms of um, what data we can get back, uh, the requirements of our um, pulse energies, pulse durations, pulse repetition intervals to actually detect and get enough information back from that return pulse to give us some idea about what we're observing. And concepts like radar cross-section weren't actually involved in this at, at the period of the, of the invention of the radar systems. But obviously radar systems have evolved uh, since the 1940s. <coughs> pulse repetition interval is the gap between our pulses. Um, 
for, to obtain a larger range, we need to keep the gaps between our pulses far enough apart on a traditional system with CW that after we've sent out a pulse, we get a return signal from our object of, of interest. If we send out a pulse, we don't get any return signal. And we send out another pulse, and then we get a return signal. Was that return signal from the first pulse or the second pulse? And this is the ambiguity around, around the radar systems. Now, as systems have developed and radar systems have developed, we've learned to encode the first pulse and the second pulse so that when the first pulse comes back, we can do, we can, or the, when we have our return pulse, we can determine whether that was from the first, second, third, fourth pulse. But this idea of pulse repetition interval still has an effect on our ability to detect, it, detect uh, and reduce our ambiguities. Um, another way of introducing more power into our signal is having a longer pulse length. Okay, so if we, if we have a longer pulse length, we, we get more power into that pulse. And so as it goes out and comes back, we have more uh, opportunity to detect that radar energy coming back to us. But if our pulses are too long, and we have maybe two aircraft that we are detecting, we may get some of that pulse coming back from the first, some of that pulse coming back from the second aircraft, and we won't be able to discern whether that's one aircraft, two aircraft, a large aircraft, or a, or a squadron of aircraft flying in close proximity. So there, is a number, there are a number of trade-offs around the use of the RF pulse. And typically what we'll see is that for a given radar system, we'll actually have different modes of operation. So we'll have a low pulse repetition, high power mode, for detection, looking out into our airspace, just seeing if there's anything in our airspace. And then once a, a target is detected, we'll shift into a high repetition, lower pulse rate, uh, lower, lower, lower interval um, PRI, and then higher, uh, and then even as we get into close range, or if we're looking at fire control, we'll go into either higher frequency Higher, higher resolution modes to actually identify individual targets. So apart from getting that single data point from a CW, one of the other impor important data points we can get, especially from if we're having a very low uh, pulse rate interval, uh, we're getting very uh, low frequency pulse rates, is using the Doppler shift of the return pulse to determine a velocity. So from one return pulse, we can get an addition to a distance, we can also get a velocity. So if that object is moving towards us, those, those frequencies are going to get squeezed together on the, on the reflection. And if the craft is moving away from us, they'll be stretched out. And typically, the frequency shifts we'd see here, if we're looking at a 10 gigahertz uh, uh, radar pulse, um, we're talking about tens of kilohertz for uh, an aircraft moving at the speed of sound. Okay, but that detection uh, is possible and allows us to get some velocity information. So as I mentioned before, a radar system you would expect actually to uh, have um, various different uh, modes of operation. And our ability to dominate this electronic spectrum is, is what all governments and uh, defense uh, systems are looking to, to cover, making sure that we can have long-range detection, making sure that we can then monitor systems, and making sure that we uh, can use in fire control, we have our, our capabilities that are enabled. Now, in developing test systems and developing systems, it means that we have to be able to, as a test company, cover all of these frequencies and provide solutions uh, across all these bands. So, now that we've covered radar systems, let's look at electronic warfare and what that means. So, electronic warfare is split into three main groups. Um, the first is electronic support, and that really is the idea, the notion of, of understanding what our environment actually looks like 
what is the electromagnetic uh, uh, battlefield looking like around me today? Uh, a notion of understanding what the terrain is. Um, this is a situational awareness, and it really is uh, specifically around the electromagnetic um, uh, uh, spectrum uh, dominance. And so, um, radar warning receivers, uh, things that will be looking out and identifying individual systems in our airspace. Uh, electronic attack is really talking about radar countermeasures, electronic countermeasures. Um, this is, these are techniques and methods that are used to disrupt and confuse radar systems. Um, we'll talk about the specifics afterwards, but these typically are grouped together in electronic countermeasures. The third group, electronic protect, is really about protecting our systems, making sure that we can maintain our operational uh, capabilities. And these tend to be grouped into electronic counter countermeasures. And I won't get into electronic counter counter countermeasures, but they exist too. So we have a battlefield of, uh, of activities that will uh, allow you to operate uh, your systems and maintain your defenses. So electronic support is reliant on signal intelligence. Now, signal intelligence isn't electronic support, but elect uh, signal intelligence is a way of building our knowledge of what capabilities our adversaries may have. Uh, and also building a database of the capabilities that our allies have. Okay, so there will be some knowledge and development and sharing of information between allies. What we need is a database of threats. Because when we're looking out and using uh, electronic support and we're looking out into our, uh, our battlefield of electromagnetic spectrum, we need to identify friends and foes. And that is based around our abilities and the intelligence that we've gathered around our activities. And this is, uh, obviously, our, our, our uh, adversaries are not going to necessarily share that information. So we need to use um, uh, recording systems and signal intelligence that allow us to go out and gather this information. So signal intelligence, or SIGINT, is based around long-term missions. So these are ongoing processes of intelligence gathering. Uh, it's, uh, there are um, uh, things like comment and electronic intelligence that allow us to gather this information. And what we're doing is building a reference database that will be used later on uh, for our activities. Now, Phil mentioned PDWs, or Pulse Descriptor Words. Pulse Descriptor Words are what we'd be gathering with our signal intelligence. Um, and these are really the fingerprints of radar systems, and really, that, although, and that they are defined by the metadata of pulse repetition interval, pulse output power, um, pulse duration, if there's any encoding. And there are various different standards for developing pulse descriptor words, but those provide us, us with a, a fingerprint of, of a radar system. Now, a given radar system may have multiple different uh, modes of operation, as I mentioned. So we could imagine for a given system, we would have multiple PDWs that would help us identify such a system. A knowledge of a radar system's modes of operation will help us uh, define whether it's currently looking and ranging and, and observing or if it's monitoring our activities or going into fire control and there's a real danger that we're, we're, we'd be uh, fired upon. So these um, post descriptor words would, be, would form the backbone of our threat database. And as I say, our allies too may be sharing that data with us. And so we can identify whether there are threats or whether these are allies. In a complex um, battle situation, or even in complex airspace with many countries being close to each other. In Switzerland, we have many, we're, we're surrounded, so it's not very far before one of our jet aircraft has to bank right before it goes into Germany or Austria or around Switzerland. In those environments, there'll be multiple radar systems. 
and an electronic warfare system will have to sort all of those radar pulses out. One way, obviously, of, of identifying a radar system apart from its identities of, of pulse repetition uh, interval, etc., is what direction it actually is in with regards to me. So angle of arrival is one of the very important um, identifiers. We need to know if the radar is here or here, and we need to be able to sort those radar systems out. So angle of arrival is, a, is, is something I'll cover shortly. But um, in a multi-emitter environment, we need to be able to sort out all of those radar systems. So the EW system has to be very complex in terms of its identification of friends, foes, radar systems, where everything is, and, uh, and building a situational awareness that can be used by, by the user. So here we have actually a, a, an example of, a, of an aircraft flying through airspace and observing one radar system. And we can imagine that, in fact, as this craft moves from point one to two to three, it will be sampling and observing this radar system. And at each point here, we'll generate a PDW that will be comprised of the angle of arrival, uh, the frequency, the power, etc. As we go to a more complex uh, situation, there may be many of these. And so these will need to be de sorted into in individual radar systems. Now, angle of arrival uh, can actually be calculated in multiple ways, and it's dependent on your EW system and your radar system how that's going to be achieved. Now, we can use simple trigonometry. Uh, if we have a radar system with uh, two antennas here, they'll have their individual uh, lobes, uh, the antenna patterns, and dependent on when the radar energy arrives at those lobes, we can actually just use uh, the inverse sign to work out, based on the time of arrival, a, an angle of arrival. So that's the time domain angle, uh, 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 angle of arrival uh, calculation. Um, if we have a more complex monopulse radar system, we actually have a system, an antenna with more complex radar uh, antenna, um, antenna pattern with uh, various lobes, we can actually use the power of that radar pulse in each one of those lobes to then calculate the angular angle of arrival. <coughs> um, similar to the time domain, we can actually use interferometry and mix uh, the RF powers together and actually use the wavelength of the uh, RF energy itself to give us, again, back to basic trigonometry, an angle of arrival based on uh, the interfering fringes. So as I say, for our aircraft <coughs> passing through uh, a complex airspace, we'll, it will be looking at multiple, ch multiple targets and observing um, and gathering information on PDWs, identifying uh, friends or foes and sorting those out and determining if there's any danger to, its, to, to, the, to the system. And these systems have to work very quickly. All of these radar signals are traveling at the speed of light. And that's much, much faster than we can make a decision ourselves. So we have uh, low latency uh, systems in place to actually uh, calculate and make decisions based on what's being observed in the, uh, in the environment. So a typical EW system is going to look like this. We're going to have multiple antennas that we're going to be gathering information with. Okay, we're going to be observing radar systems that are observing us. We're going to have uh, some RF uh, signal conversion, so we're going to actually convert that signal and extract information from it. So we're going to measure the, the pulse descriptor works. We're going to describe the energies that we're, we're receiving, and that's going to be sorted based on the angle of arrival, how many radar systems are actually uh, arriving and which systems are which. Once we've sorted those, 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 those points of data out, we're going to pull out the characteristics of those. 
Then we go into an identification mode where we look at those, those characteristics and we compare those to the threat databases that's been developed through signal intelligence. Based on what modes, which, uh, uh, what's happening in the battlefield around us, we're going to have to decide on some action. Now those radar systems may all be friendly, but there may be uh, uh, some bad guys out there looking at us, and we may need to decide what we're going to do. And that's when we move into the electronic action side of things and the countermeasures to these radar systems. So electronic attack um, and electronic countermeasures to uh, radar systems have been around since the invention of radar. So uh, mechanical uh, chaff and the release of uh, metallized strips into the atmosphere to create a cloud of scattering uh, points which would disrupt a radar system have been around since the Second World War. Uh, other mechanical uh, methods of, of attack is, is the use of decoys. And actually decoys have got much more complex. Uh, we can increase the, or, or spoof radar systems with uh, increased complexity around our, um, our radar cross-section. Um, one way of, of active um, uh, attack is to inject more RF energy into the radar system uh, that's observing us. So that's what we call jamming. And we inject noise into the system that is a, an equivalence of, of the use of chaff. We, we, we're introducing noise into the system so that the system cannot see us. Okay, so we can actually just overload the whole amplifiers in the, in the uh, radar system and we can, we can, we can confuse it and hide ourselves in a, in a noisy environment. There are other sneakier ways of jamming a radar and confusing a radar, and that's by injecting other signals in our return pulse. So we can repeat waveforms, or uh, change the frequency, or change our radar cross-section, and send different uh, signals back to the radar system and spoof it into thinking we're something that we're not. The ways that we introduce this RF energy into a radar system, um, currently I've been talking more from a, a self-protect. I've been talking about an aircraft flying through, a, through airspace and sending signals back. But we can have support craft. So we can actually have stand-in uh, support. And this typically uses UAVs with complex RF equipment on board. But you can, you can send in a, a UAV that will fly in close proximity and confuse the system. It can introduce more signals. It can provide direct, uh, directed energy towards the radar system. And that gives us uh, free reign to then come in with our, our fighter aircraft and do what we've got to do. You can also have a standoff aircraft. So we can have an aircraft that is outside of the range of the radar system with very high power RF capabilities and beam that energy in from, from a distance and use directed energy from a great distance with a, an aircraft that's out of range of, this, of the battlefield. Decoys, again, we can use, uh, we can make use of UAVs or we can use uh, towed um, decoys. Um, typically, this is a, the, these are methods that um, uh, a towed decoy is typically used for uh, against uh, air-to-air or surface-to-air missiles. And in this case, we can actually, for a fighter craft, we can actually, the decoy itself is not just a, a lump of metal hanging out the back of a, an aircraft. It's some um, complex electronics that can actually make the decoy look more attractive to the missile than the aircraft itself. So we can imagine here that we actually, within the decoy, we have our received radar signal, and we amplify that such that the return signal from the decoy is much greater than that of the aircraft itself. And we can actually very, uh, introduce um, complex electronics such that this uh, decoy, or in fact a UAV, actually has a different radar cross-section. 
So we can make a, a UAV look like a B-52 uh, if we have the correct electronics on board. Okay. So there are various different uh, decoys and we can actually uh, simulate or, uh, or use that directly for um, jamming or seduction and this making it more attractive to, as a target. Now in terms of uh, jamming, uh, there are various different ways of applying the energy. Um, we can't actually see this one because it's quite, it's blue and white. But in fact, so I'll, I'll just describe on this screen, if you can all see the, the various different ways of applying energy. So as I say, jamming, uh, noise jamming is about just uh, inserting noise and uh, energy into, a, into the uh, adversary radar system. Now, using spot jamming, we would simply inject energy that covers uh, a narrow uh, portion of the spectrum. We may, we may choose a, a band of, of operation. Um, and so this is, this is very effective if we've got a very simple radar system that's only using one band. Radar systems obviously with countermeasures have evolved so we may have a radar system that's hopping between frequencies. And if we're using a spot that means that we're only covering part of that, that radar system and we're only jamming part of that radar system. Okay. So then we talk about using a barrage and that means covering multiple, uh, multiple frequencies with much wider bandwidth. The downside of this is it's much more difficult to get high enough power to cover all of the higher power frequencies coming back from the, from the, from the radar system. So we, we spread the power, the power over a much wider bandwidth. It's much high, harder to achieve a, the high, high power that covers all of that. But we, uh, again, as I mentioned, we have, we have frequency hopping um, radar systems. We can have frequency hopping uh, noise injection. And this comes back again to our knowledge of the adversary uh, radar system itself. So if we know, based on the PDWs that we've observed, that this radar system is frequency hopping, we can, with electronic countermeasures, actually look to hop around at the same, speed, the same frequencies that that radar system is known to, to, to use. Now, I talked about being sneaky. So some, uh, some of our, instead of using jamming, we can actually uh, look to confuse and spoof um, the radar uh, into thinking we're doing something else. Um, and so we have activities such as range gate pull-off and velocity gate pull-off, which are uh, injecting pulses of energy with differing time and different frequency. So mentioned before, I mean, if you, if you think of the basic radar system which sends out a pulse and then the pulse comes back and that gives us our, our point in space for the radar system based on the time of flight. With range gate pull-off, we record the, uh, the first pulse at the, at the aircraft and then send out multiple pulses in return and the observing system is going to see multiple returns of the first pulse and what that, that, what, that will give the impression that there are multiple targets or the targets moving away in time. Okay. Now velocity gate pull-off is very similar but it's looking at the Doppler so whereas with the range gate pull-off we're looking at time we're actually um, providing a, a, another pulse with um, uh, that's higher, higher power and in fact we're going to walk that off in frequency um, either uh, uh, going to a lower frequency or higher frequency we can actually give the impression that our, our target is their target is slowing down or speeding up or moving away and that information is false information that's going to get back to the radar system and it's going to confuse it it's, it's, it's going to have a hard time working out what to actually do with this information the last, the last point is actually when we're talking about scanned, uh, scanned antenna. What we can also do is, here we have a situation where we have our, our, our actual target is, is at point A. As the scanned antenna is coming along, we're actually we're going to get most of the return energy coming here. 
But if uh, when our, we're not being scanned, we can inject more energy to that radar system, we can spoof it into believing that we're actually, that we're actually here on point B. So by injecting energy at the right time, we can actually, we, we can actually be identified at a, at a, in a different location. Um, now, one of the most complex radar systems available today is using monopulse. Um, I'll show a little bit about that later on, but to, uh, to understand it, basically I uh, think we're using polarized RF energies and we're using directional beams that are all going out at the same time, multiple beams going out at the same time with different performances. And the, the, within that pulse, we get the return pulse is going to contain uh, much more data because the, within that pulse there are various different orientations and locations that are going to be able to give us uh, an azimuth and an elevation uh, based on that return pulse. Okay. Now it's very difficult when you have only a single pulse to perform things like range gate pull-off or um, uh, velocity gate pull-off or jamming because the pulse has already been and gone. So, but if you've, you can identify that you're being looked at with a monopulse radar, you can adjust your, uh, your, your, your formation, for a, specifically for aircraft. So flying in close formation would um, enable you to fall into one cell at uh, one point of resolution. So if you're multiple aircraft, you can appear like one aircraft if you're flying in close proximity for such a system. Um, similarly, if you're, if you're also flying in close proximity, you can still use jamming signals or inject noise into that system. And typically we'll do things like um, uh, inject energy from one aircraft and then the other. And this is going to confuse the system because it's, going, it's not going to know, it's not going to be able to pinpoint exactly the source of the energy. And that's the, the technique called blinking, where we're going from one to the other. And if it's an aircraft on its own, flying in, on, uh, in low elevation, it can do something similar to blinking by sending the energy off the terrain. And so you'll get two sources of energy uh, coming at different times. One's bounced off the, off, off, off the ground. Um, and cross-eye is, in fact, where we use our, we actually receive the radar cyst, the, the, the monopulse. And as I mentioned, these are shifted in phase and, uh, um, and also in, uh, in polarization. And we can swap them around. So the return pulse, uh, in addition to the first pulse, we'll get something that's completely out of phase. Uh, we'll shift the phase by 180 degrees and we'll send it out of a different antenna and we'll amplify those and send a larger return pulse. And these are, as I say, these are, these are methods of confusing radar systems so that the automated um, systems spend more time trying to discern what the object is, what the target is. So, after we've uh, performed our electronic support and we, we've decided that we need to perform kind, some kind of action. Within our EW system then, this uh, EW system is going to decide uh, what the countermeasure action is. And we can either use mechanical uh, methods or decide that we need to use uh, DRFM, so the digital RF memory. Um, and based on that do some um, feedback or send some signals or um, based on what we've, what we've identified using the PDW and identified from our threat database. Um, now, I've talked so far about radar systems and identifying and, and, and providing countermeasure to those radar systems. The last part of this process in electronic warfare is electronic protect and this really covers the counter countermeasures and even the counter counter countermeasures <laughs> but this is these really are methods that are used to maintain our operational capabilities so we have our EW system in 
uh, on board a, a boat or a, a, or a plane. We need to make sure that we can continue to observe the threat environment and react within that threat environment. And um, be prepared for any countermeasures from an adversary. So uh, if I, if we, so we may discover that, okay, we, we, we can observe a radar system on the ground. This system, based on the PDW that we've observed, has its own electronic countermeasures. It may have a jamming system. So one thing we can do is with electronic beam steering, uh, I think, yeah, Phil, Phil, you mentioned that you showed the Eurofighter beam steering capabilities. For example, we may steer, make sure that the lobes of our radar system avoid that radar system. Okay, so we've, we know where it is. We got the angle of arrival. So we know that over here we have a radar system with countermeasures. Let's make sure we steer a null of our radar systems and we'll look all around but not directly at that radar system. So we can avoid being jammed. We have other systems. Um, so for example, if uh, we're using uh, or we're, we have something that's, um, well, our radar system detects a system that has range gate pull off, then we may specify that we will only uh, use the first leading edge of the first return pulse and just use that data, the return data as our uh, our point in, in space and use that as our detection of a system. Um, and there are multiple other uh, um, um, ways of, of, um, of electronic protection. <coughs> so I've, I've talked about digital RF uh, memory and it, uh, I've not really gone into it. Um, but within this, this is much more complex um, use of hardware accelerated processing. Based on all of the um, identification and, the, uh, and what we're looking at, DRFM is a much more complex response to uh, radar systems, so uh, things like radar cross-section, spoofing, etc. What we're talking about is actually um, providing um, complex low latency processing for, for a uh, return signal um, that's, that's required and these are embedded within the EW system. Um, so in terms of how do we test this, um, as Keysight is a test and measurement company we're involved and we, we help customers through the whole process um, and it really does, that there is no simple answer to how do you test because it depends where you are on the on, the, uh, on your workflow. And the solutions that we can offer throughout the workflow are going to depend on, on, on your, your, uh, your solution. But primarily, uh, as you go from the R&D lab all the way through to operational verification, you will be wanting to define your test system. And we've found that investment in defining what your test requirements are at the operational verification level, when you are in the R&D lab, greatly reduce the costs because you are defining, uh, as you define your system, you are specifying what parameters you will be me needing to measure in the operational environment. So we have a lot of support in terms of our software tools that allow us to, um, at a software level, already simulate and emulate uh, the operation of the complex RF uh, environment. We have capabilities to actually Im introduce environmental effects on simulation. So we have uh, tools like System View that will allow us to um, uh, allow us to build up at a software level a complex RF system with the various S parameters and in insert uh, environmental um, parameters within that, so we can. Uh, we can actually see what the signals will look like. As you move those systems into the uh, design lab and the integration, you can actually bring in together hardware and instruments into that system. So we can, we can take that simulated signal and generate it and inject it into your uh, device or, or system 
and you can observe the reaction to that. And I'll cover that later in the second presentation. But um, some of our tools are already um, primed for actually developing and, and showing this. Um, as you move into uh, the installed uh, system and, and, and test facilities, um, Keysight primarily works with uh, third parties for some of the positioning, and we provide the instrumentation to collect and generate and analyze the data that's required. And typically in operational uh, verification, we'll be looking at, uh, we'll be providing uh, handheld instruments such as the Philfox for wideband, easy access to uh, wideband spectrum anal analysis. Uh, using battery powered uh, instruments that are available and protected for uh, environments that are, can be more uh, complex. Uh, as I said before, it, it, it's important that when we are in the design stages, we're already considering the requirements in operation uh, for test because it's much easier to make changes when we're early on in that cycle. If we reach, uh, we get down uh, to the operational level of, of these systems and we are not able to correctly uh, measure the parameters or measure the, uh, and keep a system operational, then we have to go all the way back to redesign and uh, creating a new system often because uh, it's j it just becomes too difficult to develop a test system around something that we can't, we can't measure. So for um, measuring an EW system under test for an evaluation, we, we have a, mo a number of uh, instruments that can be uh, used. Phil, you mentioned the uh, UXG. This is our agile uh, source. It's comprised of a, an analog um, an analog source um, that is a very fast scanning uh, source uh, using uh, digital direct synthesis. And we can actually add on to that our vector adapter, which will allow us to uh, put complex, um, complex modulation onto that signal. Um, we can send hundreds to millions of pulses per second. And these um, sources can actually driven through uh, pr uh, provision of and actually use PDWs. So we'll, rather than uploading IQ signals directly to this source, we can actually just provide the PDW and use that to drive our, and that's obviously much more quickly, uh, quicker and allows us to stream data to these, to these sources. Um, so then we have our AW system that we're, we're looking at. And on the uh, transmitter side, we could use something like the UXA. UXA is our uh, 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 spectrum analyzer. Uh, and within that, since it has techniques within that to allow us to capture hundreds of millions of, of pulses per second. And typically what we'd be using there is things like uh, segmented memory. So rather than capturing for a long duration multiple pulses, we can set this up so that we're actually only capturing the pulses and the pulse energies that are of interest to us. So that means we throw away the, the dead time between pulses and we just capture and timestamp each one of those return pulses. Um, within, uh, within this uh, analyzer, we have an embedded processor. So within there, we can actually apply software. We can actually use things like uh, our 89600 VSA software to demodulate, analyze, extract other information so we can we can get a complex uh, analysis of the data or we can actually just do some real-time analysis in the in frequency and time domain directly through the uh, the interface on the screen these solutions are scalable so here we have a, a situation where we have uh, where we, we're taking a threat generation uh, computer we're streaming PDWs to our system and we're actually using four vector modulators with our uh, analog source to actually simulate four different um, uh, receivers going to our, our system under test. Um, and because of this, the, the, our capabilities of this system, 
actually allow us to um, very accurately control the phase and time across these various channels. And we can actually steer uh, and provide angle of arrival information to a very, very high precision. Um, all, uh, other systems may maybe only be able to get that within 20 degrees. Do we, I can't remember off the top of my head. The, we have two degrees of capability of, of, of precision on the, um, using the angle of arrival and, and phase control on the UXG. And on the back end of this, we're taking our, uh, our EW system and seeing the reaction to it, to these, these, uh, these radar pulses or this radar pulse that we're simulating here. And uh, we can actually analyze that using high, wide bandwidth, high speed digitizers here in the AXIE platform as well. Okay, so I, I hope that's all good information to you. <laughs> and I think we have a break. Or just reflection from uh, how could your system uh, determine that the reflect, uh, receive signal is due to the reflection from moving, uh, moving aircraft, I mean moving targets such as enemy aircraft, or just a reflection from a moving clutter such as storm or rain or any other phenomena? Well, yes. so, so, the, so the question was how does our system determine whether a reflected signal is from a moving aircraft or a, or moving clutter moving like, clutter, a, yes. like, a, like a cloud? So, Keysight doesn't produce these systems. We test, we, we provide test solutions to these systems. But the complexity within the, so the modulation of the signals, uh, the way that those signals are generated, and the type of concern signal will, will carry with it more uh, data that would allow us to discern the type of target that we're observing. There is this, there is, um, this notion of uh, radar cross-section that gives us an idea of uh, uh, the return signal that we would expect from our radar system. And for whether we're looking at uh, um, something that's inanimate or whether we're looking at an aircraft, whether it's a small aircraft, if it's a Cessna or a B-52, the radar cross-section is completely different. And so for clutter as well, um, that would just be noise to the system. But as I say, we have, there are systems um, even missile systems that spoof the radar cross-section using onboard amplifiers um, to actually, uh, with the return beam, actually amplify and send out a radar cross-section that, com that is comparable to another aircraft. So there are, it, it's, it's, the systems are looking to develop uh, more data in the return signal and primarily this is through wider bandwidth, and it's the same with 5G communications, uh, etc. Wider bandwidths, higher dynamic range, and using the data that, that we can gather from that to actually uh, convert that into useful information. So going from data into an identification of, uh, of the target. Thank you. You mentioned that using Doppler shift, we can distinguish between moving target and stationary. So yes, clutter. Doppler shift, for but example. Yes, yes. yes. But, uh, again, we can use uh, the same Doppler uh, frequency shift to distinguish the reflection between reflection uh, signal from aircraft or stationary. from the yeah, exactly. uh, clutter by exactly. using Doppler filter bank. Yes, exactly. So Doppler shifting, exactly, is something that will allow. Yeah, actually, this is a very interesting topic, but unfortunately, we are going to time schedule today, I have brought more of interesting papers. So I request you kind gentlemen to you know, take a 10 minute break, you know, enjoy some of those snacks, you know, socialize. And uh, we'll start exactly in 10 minutes. I apologize, it could be 15 minutes, but you know, today I have lots of very interesting papers. So yeah, please feel free to you know, enjoy your snacks. And